over knives. And uh, I have to share with you the uh, anecdote of my experience with this conference, which many of you know, of course, was formerly called Speaking of Women's Health. And at the very first Speaking of Women's Health, I was uh, asked to give a session. And at that time, it was, we termed it the world's largest facelift consult. And it was all about surgical techniques. And a lot changes in five or six years because now I'm going to talk to you about everything non-surgical today. And it's, uh, as a plastic surgeon, it's actually almost amazing to me myself to, to listen to myself say we can do all of these things non-surgically now that when I was training and in the first seven or eight years of my practice uh, were obvious surgical um, uh, events and, and people were obvious surgical candidates to me who now I just poke with a needle. Um, so what I want to do today is start by giving you a very brief overview of facial aging, what really causes it, and then we're going to go through uh, a focused effort on injectables, what we can do with the needle, and I'll show you a lot of cases. And then depending on when we finish, um, you have a handout at your chair, which is your actual roadmap, and we can, I can either take volunteers and we can do the roadmap, or we can, um, we can talk about it more globally, and, and I'll, I'll leave that up to you ladies as the, as the uh, first half hour progresses. I see volunteers, though. I see volunteers. So facial aging is something that everybody undergoes. You know, we've got ethnic variability, we have genetic variability, there's all sorts of things that play into it. I, I heard Joan London this morning talking about how only about 30% of aging is genetic based. Unfortunately, with your skin, it's a little bit higher percentage and it, we very commonly come to the conclusion that it's around 50-50 in terms of uh, your genes versus your environment. And some of the things in your environment or, or in your lifestyle that can really impact facial aging are your nutrition, and that's obvious. Oh, I should point out that these three women that you see in the photo here are all the same age. They're all 71. Um, they're all white Caucasian women. They all grew up and lived in Southern California. They don't look the same. And this is before any of them had any procedures done, too. So that, that's just to point out that your overall health um, cardiovascular fitness, how you deal with stress, what you do in terms of protecting your skin, primarily from sunlight, uh, at least down here in Southern California, primarily from sunlight, um, are all huge factors in making yourself look as good as you can um, without needing me. This, of course, is Linda Carter, Miss Universe, 1971, and that's Linda Carter two years ago. Um, everybody ages, doesn't matter where you start, everybody ages. That led us to do a, a very significant research uh, project in, in our uh, research labs. We took a series of mother and daughter pairs who looked remarkably similar. And we, we based that on, on similar age pictures. So if the daughter was 21, we took a tw her picture at age 21. And if she looked, we used several anatomic parameters. If they looked the same when they were the same age, we then did this uh, three-dimensional overlay. And what you're looking at in the wireframe here, the black speckles, is where the younger woman, the daughter, actually had more volume than her mother did. And these, I mean, this isn't telling anybody anything new. We all know this. But this really helped us quantify exactly how much your chin recedes over three decades, exactly how much volume you lose in your lip over three decades, how much volume you lose in your temples, how much you lose in your mid-face. And this really helped us understand that a lot of the changes we see with aging are actually volume-based. <coughs> Ladies, there's a lot of seats um, on the side here and over there if anybody wants to grab a seat. Um, so that really leads me to reminisce back to what our standard thinking around facial aging is, which is the beach ball theory. When you are a teenager, when you're a baby, your face is full of fat. And it's fat that's suspended and held, held up in the right place. As you age, unfortunately, the fat goes away from the face. 
it sometimes doesn't uh, go away from other places. Um, and that's, we call that the deflational theory of facial aging, and it's, it's commonly known as the beach ball. And, and if you walk into uh, the shopping mall, if you go over to Ontario Mills and you sit there for five minutes and you watch people walk by, you'll see people that you'll say, oh yeah, that does look deflated. And then you'll see all the teenagers after school and they'll have the round faces and their faces are full of fat. Um, not from the restaurants, hopefully. Um, so again, aging, and I'm not going to go into this slide in detail, has what we call intrinsic factors. Those are your, your genes, your, your ethnicity, uh, when in fact your estrogen uh, starts to withdraw for, for women, that, you know, that varies anywhere from 40 to 56, 58. And then, of course, the extrinsic factors. Um, when I first put this talk together years ago and was talking about it from a surgical perspective, I put gravity on there. And, and I realized that if you were a non-smoker, you lived in the dark and stood on your head all day, you would look young forever. Um, you would never age. Um, and that would be great. This is stress. This is eight years. That's all. Inauguration. To, um, to leaving office, and not to be partisan, um, this is eight years projected. <laughs> projected. Projected. But stress does you in. Okay, These are two people um, who are actually pretty healthy folks and, and have uh, very good health care. Um, uh, they're taken care of very well, but age, and, I'm sorry, stress uh, does them in, in in that time frame. Um, I have a couple slides that cover um, what actually happens in different decades. And looking around the room, we've got people that represent all the decades. So, so maybe we'll, um, we'll, 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 we'll actually, I'll actually speak to this. I was going to skip through this. But in the third decade of life, there's not a whole bunch of changes that happen to your face. But your eyebrows start to come down a little bit. And it is your eyebrows. It's not your eyelids. In your fourth decade of life you start to have what appears to be loose skin in your upper eyelid. Some of the fat starts to come through both the upper and lower eyelids, the so-called early bags. Um, the glabellar lines appear. These are your 11s right here. And then your nasolabial fold right here and right here starts to become a little more obvious. And then, of course, your brow continues to fall. Then you hit the fifth decade. Uh, lots of stuff happens in the fifth decade. This is when... This is when you really want to come see us, is right at the start of the fifth decade, right at the end of the fourth decade. That's prophylaxis. Um, what happens is your forehead lines are going to deepen at that point. Those 11s get deeper. The crow's feet appear, unfortunately. And that's usually for happy people, because you get them from smiling. Um, and then, of course, the upper eyelid skin uh, becomes much more, much more visible. And then you start to get or you can start to get what are called uh, lipstick lines or smoker's lines, these little cracks in your upper lip. So the fifth decade is when everything really changes. Sixth decade is kind of more of the same, but that's really when you start to see the jowls in the face. Um, and I think that's when a lot of deflation occurs is during that sixth decade, so the skin starts to hang on the side of your face. Boy, this is getting depressing. I'm going <laughs> to... I think I'm going to move a little faster through this. The tip of your nose droops, blah, blah, blah. All right, seventh decade, it's a little, it's a little shorter here. Your skin thins. That, that just happens. In, in men and women, it happens quite, quite equally, actually, in the seventh decade. There's no longer any hormonal influence. Now, we just heard from Joan London that we're all going to live to... Um, well, the person who's going to live to 120 has already been bored. I think we're only going to live to our 90s, though, is what, she, is what she implied. So we have to be aware of these. And in fact, I'm going to have to update this slide to add the ninth decade now, um, though I don't really know what happens to uh, facial aging at that point. Those people don't come see me. Um, interestingly enough, facial aging, when I can look at somebody, and with my x-ray eyes, I know exactly where the muscles in their face are because the muscles are perpendicular to their wrinkles. And you can now do that too. You can look at someone's forehead and you see these lines running like this. Well, that means the muscles run like this. It's very, very, very discreet that way. Around your mouth, the upper lip, the muscle runs around your mouth. 
the wrinkles form up and down, perpendicular. It's, so you now have x-ray eyes. You can look at, at your friend the next time you're sitting in a restaurant and you look across and say, oh, I, can, I know exactly where your muscles are. Can you do this for me? Have them do the motions. It really, it's a lot of fun at the dinner table. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that actually happen. Um, as, uh, well, we talked about what happens, but let's, let's look at it a little bit anatomically. So I like to divide the face into thirds. They're not equal thirds, but the upper third is from the corners of your eyes to your hairline. Middle third is corners of your eyes to corners of your mouth. Lower third is corners of your mouth down. So in the upper third, the obvious things, your forehead looks a little taller, kind of like mine as your hair starts to climb up your forehead, your brow starts to droop a little bit, and the corners, what we call the lateral brow, starts to get a little bit hooded. Um, and of course, you get crow's feet. So in that area, this patient underwent a surgical fix. She underwent an endoscopic brow lift, but that was five years ago. If she came to see me today, I would actually probably attempt to soften all of these with Botox, definitely soften these with Botox, and I would actually try to affect a chemical brow lift on her forehead as well and lift her brows up to what you see here. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, shortly as well. But this is the kind of, um, these are the changes in the upper third that are obvious. And, and if we go through some examples with some of you at the end of the talk, we can, we can um, point out all of your flaws to everyone in the room. Um, <laughs> now, in the mid face, you have uh, also some loss of muscle tone in what holds up your lower eyelid and restrains the fat that naturally should occur there and it starts to bulge out. Your cheek right here drops. We say that aging in the, the, the face is like a clock face and on the right hand side of your face, aging occurs counterclockwise. On the left hand side of your face, aging occurs clockwise. And things descend as if it were a clock face. Um, and that's what happens in the mid face. Sorry, it is depressing. Boy, I, we're going to have to get to some happy pictures soon. Uh, we will. Promised. Um, so, and, so again, and this is, an, this is an important word right here. You have the illusion of excess fat in the lower lid. Every one of my clinics, I will see one or two women who say, can you just take the fat out of here? And I always say the same thing, no. And it's not because I mean, it's because taking the fat out of there will simply hollow out the lower eyelids. What we really want to do, and I use this analogy, what we really want to do is smear that fat down into the crease like spreading butter on toast. And uh, that is a surgical procedure. Um, <laughs> but, but now, we have a filler, and I'm going to talk about it, that we can use successfully for what's called that tear trough, that deeper crease in the lower eyelid zone. It's called Velotero. It's very effective. I really like it. Um, in fact, I'm going to show you a, a picture of it soon. Um, so uh, now with a little bit happier pictures, this is a lady who had surgical correction of her mid-face. She had an endoscopic-assisted mid-face lift. So she, um, she had a brow lift. Through the same incisions here, we brought the video camera down and brought up her cheek. Um, she's also um, had some laser resurfacing and skin tightening, but, but that's an aggressive surgical approach. This person had no surgery. Now, it's not nearly as impressive an impact, but this was fat grafting into the mid-face right here, Bellatero, that filler, into this zone right here. And it's a sick, now, you know, it's, it's a male instead of a female face. It's not that, it's not that obvious to see curves on a man's face. Um, and we'll look at some women's faces later. But this is, a, this is one of my very early examples of using Bellatero um, in the lower eyelids, um, where you can safely fill them and, and elevate the lower eyelids a little bit. And then that leads us to the lower third. The lower third happens a little bit later in life. So remember we said that fifth decade was the bad decade for aging? Well, towards the end of the fifth decade of life, you really start to see changes in the lower third of the face. And if you think about it, the face does age gravitationally. You start aging here, then you go to here, and then you go to the, to the bottom third. When you get to this uh, lower third or the third third, 
you start to see jowls right there. And remember, all that that jowl is is this fat that fell down from here. That's why you have, that's, that is all it is. Um, it just drops is all that happens. Now, what's interesting is, again, this is one of those things. Now, you guys are all empowered with your special x-ray eyes. You know where the muscles run. But what you're going to see is you're going to see a hollow zone right here. This, the, the cheekbone, it's called the malar bone. This is the submalar hollow. So if you look at someone who in their fifth, six decades of life, you're going to see some emptiness right here because that stuff went down to here. And that's a submalar hollow. And now, so historically, and really until a very short time ago, that was treated with surgical facelift. And that's fine, that's not a big deal. I really like that operation. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about doing it instead with needles. This lady had a filler called Voluma added into her midface. Now, it doesn't look any different here, but her nasolabial fold is better. This crease on her jowl is better, and that took 12 minutes. So, and, and she goes back to work the next morning, or that, that afternoon, in fact. So this is mid-face lifting with a filler. And it's a very specific filler that's used in that area, and it's actually only been out this year. Um, so it's two weeks old. Um, so you come to all of these, um, uh, you, you read all these things in magazines, um, you hear things from me, you hear vocabulary that's weird. I made this word cloud from my own Twitter account. This is, these are the things that you, know, you, you hear about. And, and it's actually quite tough to figure out what the right thing to do is. And if you read uh, the popular magazines, if you watch TV, and, and most definitely if you listen to your friends, um, you're going to hear all of these words and they, and they don't necessarily make sense. They look just as jumbled as they do on this slide. So how do we get from here as a before to here as an after? This patient only had needles, no surgery. Um, sorry, that's, she had no surgery, but she had needles and she had a little bit of laser. Um, but she, she didn't have any anesthesia. She didn't have anything. Um, anything invasive. So take a look at some of the changes that I think are interesting. Here you see the lateral brow hooding, that temporal hooding right here, Botox. You see a lot of changes in the skin here. So these lines were eliminated or reduced with Botox as well. This was filled with Bellatero right there. This crease right here was filled with Juvederm. There's a little bit of extra volume in, uh, in the lips, and that's subtle, that wasn't of great interest to her. And she had some laser hair removal done um, as well, um, just to tidy up uh, some things. So this is, this is the true liquid facelift. This is a patient who has a significant, a really remarkable change um, that can all be done in an office chair with essentially no downtime or maybe one to two days of downtime with swelling and bruising. Um, it's also an economic solution um, because if I don't have to sharpen my scalpel, the bill is a lot lower. Um, again, I do like to sharpen my scalpel. So, so that's a whole bunch of words and vocabulary. Um, and, and you don't want to be this person. You don't want to be hearing about all the things I said, Bellatero, Voluma, Juvederm, Restylin, Perlane, Sculptra, Radies, Fat, Collagen, and, and really wonder what's the right thing for me. Um, that's what I want to help you get through with the rest of this talk. So in general, your options for rejuvenation, if you eliminate the bottom bullet here, surgical rejuvenation, everything else is stuff that you do in an office chair that you can go back to work either the same day or in the case of some of the peels and lasers, maybe three, four, or five days later. Um, but everything else is, these are, these, are, these are the real options. So if you want to know what your shopping list is, if you want to know how you're going to fill out your facial rejuvenation roadmap with everything other than surgery, this is the list right here. And that's what we're going to, we're going to focus, of course, on the, the injectable part of this today for this session, but that's really what it is. So 
this part of my talk is, is, is called you know, the right procedure for the right wrinkle. How do you choose the right thing for you, for your individual face? Because there are people in this room who would benefit from many of the things I've talked about, and there are people in this room who will not benefit from those things. And it's, it's, it's actually, uh, I probably spend more time in my typical clinic talking about who is a good candidate, uh, who isn't a good candidate for something rather than who is a good candidate. So let me go through briefly the items on this list. So you've got this term here, downtime tolerance. How long are you willing to not go to the office, to not go out to eat, to not be with your friends? That's your downtime tolerance, and we call that social downtime. It's not because you're not really going to be in pain from any of these things, except while I actually have the needle in my hand. Um, and that's only 30 seconds. But so your downtime tolerance is a big deal. And then there's duration of effect. Is it the 20th reunion from high school next month and you just need to look good for a little while to teach those guys that you know you really did make it in life? Um, <laughs> if that's the case, then you know there's some quick fixes. That'll last you three, four, five, six months, and that's great. Economically, you win there. Your Fitzpatrick class is a standard measurement how much pigment you have in your skin. It's a one to six scale. I'm a five on that scale as an example. Uh, one is the albino in the room. Um, the glow gal level is another standard scale of aging that measures the amount of wrinkles you have and how they react when you move your face. And that's just a standard thing. I look at somebody and I say, you're a glow gal two, you're a glow gal three. It's, it's a one to four scale. I don't know where I am on that. I'm not going to I'm not going to speculate. Uh, and then finally, patient desires. What are the things you really want to change? Because I can look at somebody and in my harshly critical way say, oh, I can do this, 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 and this for you. Um, but you know, that's not the right way to do it. So instead, you have to tell me what you want. So again, picking the right procedure for the right wrinkle is about skin care. It's about these injectables that we're going to focus on. And then resurfacing, things that we can do to the skin. And again, we're going to be focusing on the injectables. So there are two broad categories of injectables. Fillers, which add volume, and we're going to go into that in some detail, and neurotoxins. Neurotoxins are, is, I mean, the category leader is Botox. That's the one that everybody knows about, everyone's heard about, it's all over the news. But there's actually three drugs in that category that are available in the U.S. You have Botox itself, which is the original Actually, the, the chemical formula that is now the drug Botox, which was approved in 2001, has actually been used clinically since 1969 when it was discovered to treat um, strabismus by ophthalmologists. Um, small injection of it uh, stops muscles. It actually works at the end of a nerve where a nerve goes into a muscle. So anywhere we have spastic conditions, uh, and Botox is used in children for this, uh, if you inject the, the Botox, right where the nerve is going into a muscle, it stops the spasm. In the face, it stops what we call dynamic wrinkles. Dynamic wrinkles are those that are not there when you're playing poker and you've got that deadpan face on, but they're the ones that are there when you smile or laugh or cry and express emotion. Um, so that's the neurotoxin category, and that's what we're going to talk about first. So Botox itself is a protein toxin. It is botulinum toxin type A. And yes, if you ate enough of it, you would get food poisoning. Um, but you've got to eat a lot. Uh, it would be thousands and thousands of dollars worth of Botox to get the food poisoning part. It's been FDA approved since 1989 for strabismus. Um, but its cosmetic indication came, I'm sorry, I said 2001 earlier, 2002. But there's a very long-term experience with it. I've been injecting Botox cosmetically since 1999. Um, so that's 15 years of, of using it for cosmetic purposes. And when I say extremely few side effects, I mean extremely few side effects. You read the package insert for Botox. It is a micro font, and it would fill about four eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And that's because all those things can happen with Botox. But they happen when you use it wrong. When Botox is used correctly, there are very few complications. I have about one patient a month will develop a pretty bad headache, and that headache will last them all night. 
um, and then it goes away and the Botox still works. And then I'll have about one patient a year who will tell me that they get a little bit of a, of a cough after uh, the Botox. And I don't completely understand that one. It is one of the described complications, um, but it's exceedingly rare and it's gone within hours typically, not, not even overnight. So Botox typically in the face is used here. Uh, those horizontal lines that run across the forehead. Remember with your x-ray eyes, you know where the muscles are now. Um, and then the frown lines, the so-called 11s, which some people just have a one and some people all the way, have all the way up to 111 um, <laughs> across that zone. I'm sorry if you're in the room. Uh, and then the uh, crow's feet, of course, which appear out here. She is not a candidate for Botox, unless she's the after. Um, but uh, Botox is very effective in all of those areas. Um, so very briefly, when we administer Botox, we clean the area off. I put some marks on. That's actually a surgical marker. I actually do it with an eyeliner pencil so we can get the marks off really easily. Um, and then we use the smallest possible needle we can find. And if any of you know about needles, we use a 30 gauge, which is pretty darn tiny. Um, and here's a typical muscle that we would treat and a typical patient that we would treat. This is sort of the frontalis muscle right here. Um, this patient has a mild or subtle 11 right there starting. Here's a stronger 11. Um, so injection of that brow. When I have a patient who's not in my office for the first time, there's someone that I'm routinely injecting with Botox, the actual time it takes to do a Botox injection of this region, the forehead and glabella, is about 30 seconds. So that's 30 seconds that you feel a series of pokes. I would tell you about 20% of women will have a little tear in their eye when they're done. Um, usually I can make them smile by the time we're done. Um, but it's very quick and there is absolutely no pain after you've had Botox. Here's the crow's feet muscle. Remember, again, your x-ray eyes show you the muscle runs like this, so the wrinkles form perpendicular to the muscle. And that's where the crow's feet are, right there. Um, injecting the crow's feet is usually about three or four little shots. It's very quick to inject crow's feet. That, unfortunately, is one of the spots where I do get bruises. And I probably, have, I probably create one bruise a month. In, in, in overall in my practice, and it's always in the crow's feet area. I can't think of one patient in 15 years who I've given a bruise to in the forehead, but I can think of 10 patients last year that I gave a bruise to in the crow's feet area. Um, but a bruise is two or three days, um, so it's bad. Um, I'm embarrassed every time it happens, but that's one you have to be aware of. Nasalis, this is kind of a fun one. I learned about this muscle only after Botox was really used a lot because if someone has aggressive Botox done, forehead, crow's feet, and then they smile, you see this. So again, if you go to the shopping mall and you sit there and you watch people walk by and you see this on them, you know what, they probably had Botox. <laughs> um, and so now when I treat patients, I add one little shot here and one little shot here and now nobody knows. Um, but actually if you watch the news, I'm not gonna name any particular newscaster, female, KCAL 9, uh, uh, you can, uh, 6 p.m., uh, you will see this. You will see this. Um, again, nasalis, one quick shot each side, piece of cake. This is one I don't do a lot of, orbicularis oris, smoker's lines. I actually think most people that have those lines have what I call static lines. Remember we talked earlier about dynamic lines. Those are the ones that come when you animate your face. This woman is obviously animating her face, doing the pucker or simulated whistle. But most women actually have those lines present at rest and Botox will not help with lines that are present at rest. Uh, that's where we actually talk about fillers and, and, and maybe resurfacing and so forth there. Um, so this, and this by the way, hurts. Um, to put tiny little shots there, whereas the brow is no big deal. Again, we do it, but it hurts. Um, one, of, one of my favorite areas that, again, we don't do a lot of are these platysmal bands. Pl the platysma is, is, guys call it the shaving muscle because we tense it when we shave. Um, women shouldn't call it that. Um, but that particular muscle can form bands in the neck. And when it forms bands, and it's, and it's a muscular band as opposed to loose skin, 
it responds really nicely to Botox. And it takes, to do a band like, like this patient is about one, two, three, maybe four tiny little shots. Very quick, very easy. Uh, and the neck is not nearly as uncomfortable as other parts of the face. So it responds really well. So here you see injection of the neck band. So um, some, some uh, uh, before and afters. School teacher felt like her students always thought she was frowning at them. I didn't think she was, but she sure doesn't afterwards. Used car salesman. <laughs> I don't have too many men in my practice. They are all sales professionals. A lot of them sell cars, the rest sell real estate. Um, and uh, you know, these lines have been there for a long time because every used car salesman also smokes. Um, and, and they're outdoors. So they, they, they punish themselves. So one Botox treatment softened them. This patient ultimately uh, became a very regular, is a very regular patient of mine, and he has a close to a smooth forehead now. If you think about what Botox does, it's just like not letting you flex your bicep for three months, because that's how long it works, is a full three months. If you don't tense your bicep for three months, it becomes a floppy mess. And that's bad for your bicep, but it's really good for your forehead muscles. So Botox has a cumulative effect, not because the chemical is left behind, but because you've knocked out that muscle for so long. Crow's feet is, without a doubt, the most successful area for treating Botox. Everybody's crow's feet responds to Botox. Even if some of the lines seem semi-permanent, everybody's crow's feet re responds to Botox. You cannot lose in the crow's feet area. Um, so again, we talked a little bit about side effects. I didn't mention the funny looking side effects because the funny looking side effects come from inexperienced injectors, comes from people who actually haven't operated in this part of the body um, and don't really know that certain muscles elevate the forehead, uh, uh, sorry, certain muscles depress the forehead and certain muscles elevate the forehead. If you inject somebody in what I call the no-fly zone, they are going to have a droopy brow. And that's more than embarrassing because that's there for three months. So um, when, I, when I train physicians on how to inject Botox, we talk about anatomy way more than we just talked about it. And I really need them to have their x-ray eyes on and picturing where the muscles are underneath the wrinkles in the patient's face. And that's a big deal. Um, let's move on to injectable fillers. So there are a ton of fillers out there. And, and if you think we have a lot here in the US, in the European Union there are actually four times as many approved products um, as soft tissue fillers. And, and I can't even keep up to date with all the European products. But I know all the ones in the US that we have, that we have access to. And the fact is collagen, <laughs> collagen has gone the way of the dinosaur. I hope no one in this room ever has collagen injected into them because it is a, it's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, you should have had injected when I was a medical student, when I was a little kid, when I was in high school. Not now. Um, uh, collagen is junk and, and it goes away in weeks and it leaves lumps and bumps. And this poor lady, I mean, you know, that, and she's not even on The Real Housewives. Um, so in any case, the synthetic fillers that are available today in the U.S., I break them down into two categories. This first column here are all made from the same chemical, hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is in every one of our joints. It's in our elbow, it's in our knee. In fact, it was developed to be an injection into the joints of arthritic patients. Now, that same consistency of hyaluronic acid is not what we inject into the face. It's a lot more dense uh, when we inject into the face. Um, hyaluronic acid, depending on how close to one another the molecules are, can last as little as about four to six months, which is Restylane and Juvederm right there, to about eight or nine months, which is Perlane, to about um, uh, also in the six-month range, Belotero, to Voluma, which I put on the other column, but it is a hyaluronic acid, which lasts two and a half years. That's the magic one. 
but it's, remember, it doesn't dissolve because the molecules are closer together. The molecules being closer together makes it firmer. We don't put voluma in the lips. We don't put voluma in parts of the face that move a lot. We put voluma where you need volume, in that sub-malar hollow that we looked at when you, once you have your jowl. So that's what voluma is. So again, these are all high hyaluronic acids. Radius is calcium hydroxyapatite. That's bone without the calcium. Decalcified, deionized uh, stuff. Radius is a great product. It is used all over the body. It's used by orthopedic surgeons. It's used by voice surgeons to be injected into the voice box. Um, it's injected in, um, into actually the bladder, the outlet of the bladder in women that have urinary leak. Um, it's, a, it's a very good product. I no longer use it in the face. Little too firm for my tastes. Um, and now that we have so many other options, um, I don't use it. I actually used, Radius was approved before any of these were. So that was the first filler I used in the face after, um, after collagen. Um, but I don't, I've moved past it. It's still available commercially. It's still promoted commercially. You'll read about it. Don't get it. Don't use it. It's just too firm. Sculptra, completely different category of filler. It's actually, they don't actually like to be called a filler. The, the company likes Sculptra to be called a volumizer. Where you inject it, it sits, it attracts water, and it holds that water there. So again, if you fill in this area, over, over the course of, a, of about a seven to 10 day period, you actually volumize or fill that area, and you get a very slow lift of your cheek. Nice product. It's a little bit complex to use, so I'm not quite as big a fan of it as some of the other products, but the results are really good. Uh, with Sculptra. And then finally is Voluma again. So Voluma, again, is the same chemical as these four, but two and a half years. So let's talk about where we can put these in the face and, and which one I recommend where. So um, if you want the outer third of your lip augmented and you have a little corner, a little downturn right here, you use Restylane or Juvederm and that's the right product for you. You're gonna get five or six months duration out of it, but it's soft, it's very forgiving, looks incredibly natural. If you have a deeper fold here, what we call the marionette lines, or as my patient yesterday referred to them as the howdy doody lines, um, or you have a fold right here, the nasolabial fold, I, I prefer a product called Perlane. You get a little more duration out of it. It's a little bit firmer, and it takes a little more force when I'm holding my needle to put it in, but you get close to a year in this area, and you probably get eight or nine months right here. So again, right around the mouth, Juvederm and Restylane, which are chemically the same product. They're made by two competing companies. Each company will tell you a different song and dance. They're the same. I've used both of them for eight years, and, and I use whichever company will sell it to me for five bucks cheaper than the other one because I can sell it to you for five bucks cheaper than the other one. And now they both sell them for the same price, so we keep them both on the shelf. Uh, so again, Juvederm and Restylane right here, Perlane right here. But now you see how this particular patient is marked, and you know she doesn't really need this. Um, she's just a model. Um, but to, to fill in this zone right here, because she's got such a big jowl, um, we're going to use Voluma, and that's where Voluma goes. If you want to accentuate the cheekbone, I like Perlane there as well. If you want to give yourself a more prominent chin, I like Perlane there as well. If you want to even up a little bump on the top of your nose, I like Perlane there as well. So, in, 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 in the simplest of terms, Juvederm and Restylane around the mouth, Perlane in all the folds that you have, Voluma to fill the cheek, and then finally, in that tear trough, a brand new filler, a relative, well, four month old filler called Bellatero. Bellatero chemically is very, very, very similar to Restylane and Juvederm, but the solution that they created the gel in refracts light differently. When you put Juvederm or Restylane in very thin skin, which we all have, you can pinch your lower eyelid, it is really thin. Um, if you put a filler right underneath that, other than Bellatero, 
you see a bluish tinge. That one will take more like an hour sitting in the shopping mall if you want to see somebody walk by with that one in their lower eyelid because they're, they're not as common. Most people have learned their lesson the hard way. But I, I've done it, unfortunately, years ago, and you create this little blue line where you tried to fill. Bellatero does not bend light that way, so you don't get the optical illusion of blue. So the tear trough belongs to Bellatero, um, and, and it is very effective in that area. Um, but what about fat? Fat's my favorite. Um, not in food, not in the midsection, but fat is my favorite filler in the face. And it is spectacular. And um, I probably am now at the point where I'm doing one to two fat grafts to the face almost every week now because I think the results you can achieve with fat in the face are amazing. I've always liked fat grafting. I learned how to do it literally 15 years ago, but what I do today is completely different than what I used to do 15 years ago. And we're gonna go through um, how we do it. So um, this is a, a patient lying on her side. She has a little bit of fat that she doesn't like on her uh, um, flank, so-called love handle. Um, so this is a syringe, which of course you can use to create suction. And uh, with a back and forth action, simple liposuction, the patient's awake, of, of course, you just have to put a little numbing in. We harvest fat. Then we transfer the fat into small syringes that we spin in a centrifuge. Centrifuge, in this case, spins 3,000 revolutions per minute. And it separates out uh, anything that you put in a centrifuge by its weight. So when you pull the fat out, you see this. So in this, if you and you may not be able to see this entirely clearly, but this upper layer here looks like cooking oil. And that's because it's oil. Don't cook with it. Um, but it is oil. That's the broken up fat cells. That's trash. We throw that away now. We used to inject that. The bottom looks red. It's the blood containing layer. And it usually has a little bit of local anesthetic too. That's not, that doesn't survive either. What's left, which really only represents about 55 or 60% of the fat that we harvest, are the good fat cells. So we throw away this, we throw away this, and we're left with this stuff. But here's what we've learned literally in the last year. We've learned that fat, and we've always known that fat contains stem cells. And if you leave the US, you will see all sorts of stem cell facelifts. You will see stem cell um, rejuvenation treatments. You will see stem cells being used to grow new cells for the pancreas. You will see stem cells being used to grow new heart cells. We don't do that in the US. We have um, laws that prevent us from isolating stem cells and then uh, expanding them and then re-injecting them in patients. Many of you are aware this is a, a very hot political potato right now. Uh, however, what we do know is that in fat, that little white area that you see right there, which is part of the good fat, is called commonly the SVF, the stromal vascular fraction. That is full of stem cells. That does not need to be processed. So now I'm separating the good fat into the super good fat and just the filling fat. So I put the super good fat in areas where I want to change the biology of the skin, where there is rippled, irregularly pigmented skin. I'm putting the SVF fat there and using the rest for just volume magnification. And it's working. It's really working well. And that is a complete innovation. I didn't do this before October of 2013. That's, that's, when, that's when the, and this came from Europe, the uh, first paper was ever presented on SVF isolation and how you get it out of the syringe and what it's really good for. Um, and, and that's brand new stuff, and that's partly why I'm super excited about fat grafting. So fat grafting, again, local anesthetic procedure. You come in. If you want, we give you, we give you a Valium. You lie down. I numb you up. I take the fat out. After that, it's done. It's really not a big deal. It's really not a big deal. Um, then, then depending on where I'm putting the fat, um, you know, we usually put it in very small syringes with very small needles, and then we inject it all over. I, I, I don't have any of my SVF patients that are more than four months out. 
So I didn't want to show those yet, even though I think they're spectacular. Um, this is a year post-fat grafting um, to the upper lip and to the, what we call the commissure and, and to the lower lip. It's a very nice rounding effect. Fat grafts work great. Most patients will give me a lot of fat. <laughs> they don't fight. They don't charge me what I get charged to buy the Juvederm and the Restylane, which we buy by the CC, whereas I will now typically put between 11 and 13 cc's of fat into half of a face. In Juvederm dollars, 11 cc's is uh, $5,000. So fat grafting is becoming the economic solution now. So it's, it's your tissue, it stays, um, it's fun because we play loud music when we harvest the fat, um, and it really works really well. So fat grafting is cool, period. Um, resurfacing. I'm not going to get into the details. This doesn't fall under needles. I don't use needles to resurface. Um, but there's all sorts of things. There's things that you can buy over the counter. You can buy very good face washes. You can buy very good skin toners. You can buy salicylic acid. You can buy even glycolic acids over the counter and take good care of yourself. And that works until you remember those decades, right? Until the fourth and fifth decades start to hit. Then you move it up. You move it up to something that probably is going to be based on a vitamin A derivative like Retin-A or something that's going to be based on one of our pigment creams like hydroquinone. Um, then you move up to chemical peels. <laughs> then you move up to lasers and lights that are non-ablative. Ablation means destruction, so the so-called lunchtime lasers. They don't do a lot, but they do a little. And then finally you move on to real lasers, ablative lasers. Ablative lasers have downtime. Remember, we talked about social downtime. Ablative lasers have a minimum of three or four days, probably typically five or six days, and if I really turn up the juice, two weeks of social downtime. So that's not, that's not the quick lunchtime stuff. Lunchtime lasers, you get what you pay for. You get a little impact. Hopefully you didn't pay too much, um, but you just get a little impact. All right, so let's summarize what we've talked about at this point. So we really focused in on these injectables. I hopefully convinced you that there are really good fillers out there, including fat, and that the paralytics or neurotoxins like Botox are also very good. So um, now, um, can anyone tell me what time it is? I'm not wearing a watch, sorry. 11.35? Okay, so we have 10 minutes before I think you're, I'm supposed to release you. So... Um, what in 10 minutes, maybe what we should do is we'll just talk through the facial roadmap so you can make your own notes if you want. Um, and then it's pre filled out, but and I don't have to do any work if you come see me, it'll really save a lot of time. So, uh, basically, and I recognize some of you will want to go at this point, and that's fine too, I won't take it personally anymore. Um, uh, brow position is the first thing. So, is your brow where it was when you're 20? No, of course, it's not. But is your brow actually down uh, at a point where you want to do something about it? A woman's ideal brow, and I can't demonstrate on me, but a woman's ideal brow, the hair bearing portion should start on the bone, it should arch upward, and the tail should stay up. That's the ideal position of a woman's brow. Um, and if it's not there, we can do things to get it there. <laughs> If it's not too low, we can use Botox and create a chemical brow lift, and that's very effective. So that's brow. Upper eyelids. Most of the time that you have a fold in your upper eyelid, it is because your brow has come down. Now that applies in the fourth and fifth decade. Sixth, seventh decade, well, maybe, it's, uh, maybe there is actually extra skin there too. So first you correct the brow. Upper eyelid, there's really only two things we do. One, we can take out skin when it's necessary. Two, I have started to inject fat along the bony ridge, which by virtue of filling, tightens and lifts the upper lid. I've only done it a few times, but I think it's really cool, um, and there's no real risk. If it doesn't work, you don't notice anything, but if it works, you've corrected part of the upper lid. Then we move to the lower eyelid. The lower eyelid can have loose skin, it can have prominent fat, and it can have the tear trough, which is that depression 
over the bone where if you cried, the tears would accumulate, and that's why we call it a tear trough. So tear trough, I already told you, it's Bellatero. If you have a lot of prominent fat, then we're going to spread the butter on the toast. That's surgery. Um, and if you have loose skin, we can try lasers on it. So that's your lower eyelid zone. Then we move into the mid face. Now mid face to me is this zone right here. So it doesn't include the corner of the mouth. It's this fold and probably some hollowing right here. Mid face, I think we can do a lot with fat. I think we can do a lot with Voluma. And of course we can do a lot with surgery, but the mid face, you really can benefit from these, these needle based techniques. And that, that's, that's, you know, if I were to pick one area where the fillers really help, it's going to be in the mid face. Um, then I, I wrote the nose lip fold. And I, I wrote that specifically because that is not the clinical term. The clinical term for this is the nasolabial fold. But some people develop lines across here, too. And those are nose lip folds as well. That's filler territory. That's your purlane that we talked about. Um, and that works well. Or it's a facelift. Because again, I actually like facelifts a lot. Um, <laughs> Um, then we come to the perioral skin. The perioral skin, that's your smoker's lines or lipstick's lines. That's the creases here. There's only two things you can do for that. That is not surgical. As much as I like surgery, I have nothing surgical to offer here. You add volume, fat, Juvederm, Restylane, those all work really well around the mouth, or you resurface. You use a laser or aggressive chemical peels to smooth fine lines. So it depends. Deep creases, fill them. Superficial creases, resurface them. And that's your perioral. Then lip volume, of course, that's filling. There's nothing else. That's, you can use fat, you can use Juvederm, you can use Restylane. Jowl presence. So when I first made this chart up years ago, if you had a jowl, you got a facelift. Now, if you have a jowl, we can think about fat grafting into here or adding Voluma into here. Necklines, that's tough. By the way, necklines are actually really tough to treat. So lines that run this way, those platysmal bands, that, that shaving muscle that I showed you earlier, that is Botox territory. But more women probably have looser skin here. I don't have much that I can do with needles or lasers to the neck. That becomes surgery for the most part. I think most things you do to your neck that are non-surgical are a waste of money. Um, in fact, everything that I know of that you can do to the neck other than surgery is a waste of money. So your neck, don't spend any money on it. Wait till you're ready, then come in for the facelift, um, and you do that. Um, final message I have for you as we come to a close is pick the right person to go to. You don't have to come to me, but go to someone who is a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Don't go to anybody less you will ultimately regret it. Um, I thank you all for your attention. Uh, I hope it was educational, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You're welcome.